a uh, couple of announcements with a slight uh, change in the speakers a couple of them could not be here with us today so instead of dr rohit shetty dr natasha pahuja is going to be presenting on dry eye near paradigms and uh, uh, apart from that the the surgical topic is is not there so dr himanshu will be speaking on punctal plugs so basically this this course is a kind of overview of dry eye there's a lot of talk uh, recently on dry eye because a lot of companies are coming out with newer devices and things so uh, the way we are going to go about this is i am covering the investigations and treatment based on the tfos dues to uh, recommendations and then individually some of the other topics will be covered by my uh, co instructors so i think it is 9 o'clock and we will start off with the first talk and i'm going to be first speaking on diagnostics uh, beyond shermers and tbut so dry eye according to the tfos dues to classification is a multifactorial disease of the ocular surface characterized by a loss of homeostasis of the tear film accompanied by ocular symptoms in which tear film instability hyperosmolarity ocular surface inflammation and damage and neurosensory abnormalities play an etiological role so this is a very very broad uh, classification there's no per se such th thing as dry eye i mean it's a gamut of different conditions uh, now how i'm going to go go about this talk is basically look at what were the the headings under which the the tfos dues to looked at it so we are looking at questionnaires uh, the ones that we routinely use functional tests tear film instability tests that measure that uh tear volume tear film composition damage to the ocular surface inflammation and eyelid aspects so i'm going to briefly at the end of this tell you what amongst these tests is kind of useful in a clinical uh setting now coming to questionnaires uh the ones that we standardly use are the the speed and the osdi questionnaire the one that i have been using in uh, my clinic is more the speed questionnaire uh basically uh, it it also tells you uh, it has certain questions regarding the the time timing of onset how dry eye affects visual disturbance and the functionality of the patient the osdi questionnaire is based on 12 questions that assess dry eye symptoms there are three subsections on environmental triggers ocular symptoms and vision related function it's validated it's a simple and fast questionnaire to answer Uh, it helps in effective discrimination between mild moderate or severe dry eye and uh, it's fairly easy and intuitive to use now coming to the next section which is functional tests uh, what the tfos described was aberrations uh, we don't routinely look at aberrations in dry eye but there are certain machines like the uh, ocas system which give you the tear film osi which basically measures how the scatter the point spread is scattering Uh, according to the different time intervals that are occurring uh shine flag images in, along with that the back scatter, uh, scatter that you get has also been described in literature as a, a thing that you can look at and something called functional visual acuity which is the visual acuity measured with the patient's habitual prescription during 10 to 20 seconds of sustained eye opening without blinking because what we often do in our clinics is ask the patient to blink and quickly look at uh, the visual chart what he is actually seeing has to be without blinking so this is another parameter that can be looked at however again you said that none of these functional tests is really very important as far as dry eye is con concerned coming to tear film instability there's a tear break up time which is the interval of time that elapses between a complete blink and the appearance of the first break in the tear film now this is divided into with fluorescein and the non contact tbut uh, the one with fluorescein Uh, again st standard has st uh, stood the test of time however studies show that fluorescein does destabilize the tear film we have to be careful that we use a preservative free drop when we are actually using this and we make sure that the same amount of fluorescein is being instilled so a common mistake is to use the same strip for both eyes which should not be done so the volume has to be standardized and you have to use a standardized pattern of doing the test so ask the patient to blink 3 times and then go ahead with asking him to keep the eyes open and not blink so various devices like this is a, a diagram from the a picture from the ocular keratograph give you the non contact t but which is an observation of the specular reflection of the illuminated grid pattern from the tear film uh, you can also have observation of placido disc images reflected from the anterior ocular surface with topography systems such as the keratograph 
values are higher than the non uh, than the t but the contact t but by 3.7 seconds so you have to kind of keep that in mind uh, again standardized technique is important and studies have shown that this has a higher sensitivity and specificity compared to the normal tbut now thermography is uh, a, a technique which is used to measure the temperature of the ocular surface in a non invasive manner by using uh, photographs so the cooling rate is faster in individuals with dry eye disease the exact area showing temperature reduction is determined by analyzing a series of images over a period of 9 seconds again not a very practical thing to use in in clinical practice just a mention of this in the report uh, and tear evaporation rate is again dependent on humidity and temperature which is very difficult to standardize in our clinical setting another thing which is mentioned in tear volume is the meniscometry the tear meniscus uh, serves as a reservoir supplying tears to the preconeal tear film and it can be measured using a slit lamp or a fd oct the values that are described characteristically for the fd oct a value of 0.2 or greater is is normal and uh, sorry 0.3 or greater is normal and on the keratograph it is 0.2 or greater again meniscus can be uh, affected by blink rate uh, uh, the locus along the lid margin the time of the day so again you have to take this kind of with a pinch of salt uh, the phenol red uh, phenol rod th uh, thread test this is a, a thin cotton thread soaked with phenol red which is a ph sensitive dye uh, when dry the thread assumes a yellow color but when moistened by the tears due to the ph uh, change it turns red a cut off of greater than 20 is taken as normal now looking at the next series of tests which looked at tear film composition uh, the tear osmolarity uh, is measured by the tear lab osmometer which is based on electrical impedance it collects a 50 nanoliter tear sample and provides instant assessment of the tear osmolarity uh, the inter eye variability is actually important now very often when you use this device it it actually keeps giving you readings which look fairly normal so inter eye variability is something to pay attention to and inter eye variations greater than 8 milli osmoles are significant the second thing to look at is repeated measurements so dry eyed uh, patients typically show elevated and unstable readings on repeated measurements uh, so moderate to severe dry eye uh, disease is classified with an osmolarity greater than 316 and mild dry eye 308 to 316 anything less than that comes under normal uh tear osmolarity is also affected by which area of the eye you are taking it from so again not exactly full proof so none of these tests that i have mentioned so far you should take them as okay this is a gold standard and i'm going to diagnose based on this uh another thing is the analysis of the lipid layer this is done by the lipi view which is an, uh, based on white light interferometry uh it provides an interferometric color assessment of the tear film by specular reflection you can see the two videos over here playing uh the one on your uh, right is the one with a good tear film where you can see the oily layer uh, reflecting well uh a poor lipid layer is characterized by a dull appearance as is seen on the image on the left side another thing that this uh device can do is it it you shouldn't take it at face value again because if you get a high lipid layer but you have something like this which is a hypersecretory kind of uh mgd Uh, where you can clearly see that there's something wrong the blinks are not complete and there is a very thick altered lipid layer again be careful of these conditions and this device helps you to detect this so why is lipid layer important because severe dry eye uh, symptoms are associated with thin lipid layers of less than 60 nanometers where symptoms uh, become better generally with greater than 75 nanometer thickness however again this is not a panacea that you have to use all the time uh a very important thing is to express the mebum from the glands when you are evaluating to actually see what is the quality of the mebum that is coming out now various different paddles and uh, forceps have also been designed for this but what you have to remember is that pa patients are very sensitive to the amount of pressure that you are applying on the lids so you between 5 and 40 psi is the actual value which is useful to express out mebum but very few can actually tolerate that kind of pressure Uh, so using the mebomian gland evaluator you give a, a standardized amount of pressure uh, it doesn't allow you to give a pressure more than that more than 6 uh, psi and according to that then you can grade the glandular expressibility so zero no secretion 
one inspissated or filamentary secretion, two cloudy liquid secretions, and three is clear liquid secretion. And these are just diagrammatic uh, representations of the same. Uh, just a quick audience poll, how many people actually perform expressibility in their clinic when they're uh, doing uh, evaluation for a dry eye patient? How do you perform it? And uh, okay, so a few, it is advisable to do this, but you have to be careful when you are using imaging devices not to do it in the beginning of your examination because you'll alter your lipid layer analysis if you have that. Uh, another thing which is more uh, theoretical rather than uh, clinically practical is uh, tear ferning. Ferning occurs when the tear film is dried, typically on a glass plate. Uh, uh, it's kept for seven to 10 minutes. You can see that in healthy tear samples, it produces a compact, dense ferning pattern. And in dry eye disease, as you can see in the image, the pattern is fragmented or absent. Coming to uh, impression cytology, this has been used in, in certain conditions to look at the cells from the first to third most superficial layers of the epithelium. And then these can be subsequently analyzed for various different conditions like uh, 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 pemphigoid, etc. Now, late parallel conjunctival folds is something that is important to look at. These are found in the lateral lower quadrant of the bulbar conjunctiva parallel to the lower lid margin. So this basically co correlates with your conjunctival calaces. Uh, it correlates with less mucin production and with lid viper epitheliopathy. It's related to the completeness of blinking, speed of blink, and viscosity. Uh, so this is the grading system uh, as per the TFOS classification. Uh, zero, no conjunctival folds. Uh, grade one, one permanent and clear parallel fold. Two permanent and clear parallel folds is grade two, and more than two is in grade three. Now, lid viper epitheliopathy. Uh, the the conjunctiva at the lid margin is very important in spreading the tear film, and therefore uh, it is very important to analyze this. Uh, how you do it is by staining, and along with that, then you have to look at uh, what is the amount of staining of the lid margin epithelium. A uh, horizontal length of staining less than 2 millimeters is grade 0, uh, 2 to 4 millimeters grade 1, 5 to 9 is grade 2, and greater than 10 is grade 3. So you can see the diagrammatic image of the same over here. I think we're experiencing some technical difficulty over here. Uh, any questions in the meanwhile? So in the meantime, Dr. Rashad, if there was one uh, investigative modality that you would uh, definitely be, uh, you know, looking forward to, or uh, one investigation that you would definitely do apart from the clinical tests that you do, what would you choose yes, and so why? So far, uh, I think a meibomian gland analysis is the most uh, important one. I was just coming to that, actually. So <laughs> we'll go ahead with that. I think sure. it started working again. But yeah, that's probably the most important thing, which is the most reproducible that you can actually look at. Okay. <laughs> 
Okay, the next thing that uh, is important is to look for ocular surface infl inflammation. So how do we detect this? Uh, currently, the only available kit for this is the Inflamadry, which looks at MMP9. Uh, if the values are greater than 40 nanograms per ml, you can detect it. It's kind of like uh, a pregnancy strip where the thing turns purple when you have a value greater than 40 nano nanograms. You collect it from the lower fornix, making sure that you're not rubbing the, the lower fornix. Now cytokines, various different cytokines have been described, but again, this has not reached a stage where it's clinically relevant yet. Coming to mebography, this is what uh, I was talking about, which Natasha asked just now. So mebography is done by any infrared source which enables you to look at uh, the meibomian gland architecture. Now you do not require a specific device for this, although there are various devices available in the market which are very uh, easy to use, they help you to quantify the amount of gland dropout, etc. But you can even do this with an autoref in your clinic because it has an infrared source. So how you grade this is grade, uh, grade zero where it's normal. Grade one, as you can see, is fewer than three partial glands. Grade two, greater than three partial glands. And grade uh, three, well, more than three partial glands are lost over half the length. Now, gland dropout is another thing to be uh, looked after because your treatment depends on this. So gland dropout for grade one, less than one third area of gland dropout, grade two, one third to two third area, and grade three, more than two third area. So this is the overview printout from the Lippy View device, which gives you both the mebography as well as the lipid layer, and it tells you about partial blinking. Partial blinking is again important because the blinks actually spread the, t uh, the uh, meibomian uh, secretions. They also help to express out the, the secretions. And a lot of computer users tend not to blink properly. So blink hygiene has been getting a lot of importance recently. Now the currently available devices that can do this there's the keratograph, the ocular surface analyzer from SBM, and the Lippy View. Uh, there might be some others in the market, but these are the ones that I have uh, experience with. Uh, the OSA is a very handy device which can be put onto a slit lamp and used. Uh, the Lippy View has the advantage of giving you a lipid layer breakup. I'll just show you an overview from the OSA as well, which gives you multiple uh, different parameters, and it's a very versatile device which can give you all these things. So. Coming to the important thing in this, what is the sequence do you, uh, which you actually follow in your dry eye clinic? Uh, well, the TFOS recommendation is for the questionnaire to be administered first. If you have a non-invasive TBAT measuring device, then do that next. Look at the blink rate and blink interval, the lipid layer thickness. All this before checking the expressibility of your glands, the tear meniscus height, osmolarity, and then follow that by fluorescein staining for TBOT and staining pattern. After this, you can do a Schirmer's, and then finally your MGD characterization by using a mebographer. And this is just a diagrammatic representation of uh, the recommendation from uh, the TFOS thing. This is our workup sheet, which we had designed in, in Shroff Eye Center to look at various different things. This is given to each dry eye patient along with a speed questionnaire. Uh, and then we, we give this to the patient after that. We, we score it, we draw it, we kind of explain what your diagnosis is. And then the treatment plan is also mentioned in this sheet. So coming back to that first slide that I showed you, what is practically useful? Yes, questionnaires, you can give them to your patient. Uh, either the speed or the OSDI I found work equally well. Uh, TBOT is something that you have to do. If you have a non-contact TBOT, definitely worth doing it as well. Uh, Schirmer's is useful. Meniscometry will also be given by any of these devices. So it's another thing which adds uh, value to your diagnosis. Osmolarity I've kept in purple because I've had a little bit of a mixed uh, relationship, so to speak, with it because my results have never been very consistent and I can't really make up my mind about it. Uh, lipid layer is something that uh, does help you in your diagnosis as well. Uh, however, mebography and blink analysis are more important. So if you have a device which gives you all this, it's definitely worth looking into. Uh, damage to the ocular surface staining still t stands the test of time. It is important to look for lid viper epitheliopathy. So if, if you can, just try and do that as well. MMP9 uh, kits, if available, again, do add to your diagnosis, but it's not mandatory. Thank you. I'd like to now, uh, firstly, any questions? Dr. Manchu, any comments on uh, the sequence and any devices that? Sure. 
Okay, so I'd like to invite Dr. Natasha uh, next, or... She's going to be speaking on dry eye and newer paradigms, so the newer things in dry eye. Um, thank you, Dr. Rashad. Uh, you've uh, basically covered, uh, given a very good preamble for what we are discussing next. And um, uh, I'll be speaking on behalf of Dr. Rohit Shetty uh, because of some air shows, some flights have been pre-poned and postponed, which is why he had to leave a little earlier. Um, so what are the newer paradigms that we are looking at um, in, uh, in dry disease? Most importantly, uh, let's just approach these dry disease by just one case example, which has intrigued most of us. Uh, in our clinic. So this is a 55-year ophthalmologist. Um, she's quite symptomatic. She was diagnosed as moderate MGD, um, has evaporative diarrhea disease, and she's very unhappy with all the treatments. And imagine she's been diagnosed for dry disease and on treatment for 18 years now. So uh, if you actually speak to her in detail, she gives you this uh, chart, and she has tried out every medicine on earth. And then she'll tell you, with this combination, the pain relief that I get or the score that I would like to give out of 10 is this much. So she's basically tried every single drug therapy individually and in combinations and she tells you that this works best for me. Um, so if somebody is so receptive uh, and she's still not able to find the right answer and we're not able to give her the right treatment, uh, what is it that we need to look at? So this is when we started looking at in a slightly deeper, uh, to understand it, un understand dry disease slightly deeper. So there are tear uh, phantoms as we call them and most importantly this was one of them that we started exploring. Uh, if you look at it, it says that um, dry disease also has got some role uh, with the emotional state as in people who have got PTSD or um, have, um, have stress uh, disorders or there is some weak correlation that still exists what we did was we wanted to probe further and see. So there is definitely an Im inflammation depression axis. So if there is inflammation uh, either generalized in your body or localized to a particular organ, it certainly causes some amount of depression. And this depression is what uh, sort of sets it into a vicious cycle which causes more inflammation. Um, and we need to break this cycle. So essentially what we looked at in this uh, case uh, after doing a thorough literature review, we found that nutritional status of an individual, also the gut microbiome. Now this is something uh, which comes as a surprise to us also. The gut microbiome or the commensals in the gut are something that uh, determine the health status, the mental health status also of your body. Now there's a lot of research going on on this as well. Uh, we still to understand this in a little more detail, but vitamin D Earlier, when we were treating uh, dry air disease with vitamin D, people were like, what is the role of vitamin D? But there's enough and more evidence now that vitamin D does have a role. Well, not only in inflammation, but also on the depression. Um, why are we discussing all this? Is because the behavior of eye, the behavior of a response um, to the body is changing with time, with is, it's changing because of the inflammation. And essentially, what are we looking at today? We are looking at specific drug targets. Very, very customized treatment for each individual patient that comes to us. Why is this? Let me explain you with, uh, let me just um, detail it with this example. Now, in 1970s, uh, whatever was the population, if there is any dysregulation, it had a lot to do with the local microbiome as well as the gut microbiome. Most importantly, dependent on our, it is dependent on our lifestyle and the kind of food that we eat. 
now this is what determines the outcome of the treatment also which is why i'm sure the old age thinking that you have to eat well before you go for surgery you have to Im develop your immunity that still holds true um over a period of time we have seen that our microbiome has changed why because our lifestyle has changed our diet has changed and this again determines how our eye responds or how our body responds to any sort of treatment so which is why it is important that we want to you know understand all this incorporate into our clinics but let's go back to our uh, 55 year old ophthalmologist we wanted to understand now if she's complaining of pain constantly um she's not happy so we wanted to see what how is the paradigm of dry eye uh, expanding so much now this brings us to the uh, dues 2 classification was, which was recently worked on um what's new dry eye disease now takes 43 words to define dry eye disease so you can imagine the multifactorial a uh, component that the dry eye has now most importantly the new uh, addition was the neuropathic component in dry eye disease definition by dues 2 um which explains the so called pain or the sign not proportionate to symptom part of of dry eye disease so what we did was we wanted to see whenever there is pain we think of nerves we wanted to see what is driving uh, uh pain in dry eye disease this will be of course uh, covered more in detail by um, dr rashmi uh, but just a uh, small preamble to that what we did was in a dry eye disease cohort uh, we looked at the nerves and we saw that there were increased dendritic cells now this has been published there is increased dendritic cells be it mature or immature but what are we looking at is the nerve patterns now if you look at uh, these are the normal nerves uh, the images on the top the a and d the image on the c is basically is what we look at a confocal image where there is nerve tortuosity if there is a neuroma or if there are bleeding um essentially in this case what we found was that the nerves were fairly okay there was in some cases decreased uh, uh, nerves but in some areas there was increased dendritic cells most importantly what we found this is an another case um what we found was uh, there were micro neuromas now these neuromas are uh, 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 it's been published that these neuromas are responsible for the pain component of dry eye disease now we have uh, uh, published our group has published this where we have uh, basically looked at if we uh, the bowman's uh, imaging which is a high resolution imaging um, we have we have noticed a break in the bowman's layer now this break um our hypothesis was uh, when we co uh, correlated this on the confocal imaging our hypothesis was that there was a neuroma uh, approximately in the same region unfortunately there's no way to uh, uh, mark it because um there are no surrogate markers when we do confocal or um when we are uh, doing the oct so uh, essentially it's just a visual axis that works as our um uh, our marker so essentially what we found in this case was that uh, this patient had breaks as well as had micro neuromas which was explaining the pain component or the neuropathic component of of dry eye disease that we experienced so in in our case in this uh, lady uh, who's an ophthalmologist her confocal nerve analysis did show some amount of dendritic cells um over a period of time we wanted to see if this corresponds to the molecular component so what we did was we looked at the molecular uh, signature we collected the tears essentially how we do is we collect these tears put them in microfarge tubes sterile tubes um these tears are stored at minus 80 degrees of course they undergo tear extraction and depending on what are we looking at at the end of the day either they undergo flow cytometry or tear proteomics um so this tear uh, cytokine analysis which happened on the flow cytometry um in this case explains that there is increase amount of um inflammation and uh, increase factors which cause nociception so the anti nociceptive fac factors go down and the pro nociceptive factors go up which explains why the patients experience um pain what we have also started doing is that um this is what we call as the ocular wash for the immune or the immune wash essentially uh, the um the ocular surface is is washed and the the entire wash is collected in a tube now this tube is sent for analysis 
um, which has got the cells. Now, interestingly, what we found was that most ocular surface inflammation have got similar kind of inflammatory cells that are significantly elevated. Now, Dryer disease as well as keratoconus. These days, we are also calling keratoconus as an inflammatory disease. So, while they have inflammation, similar markers, but the signature is significantly different for keratoconus and Dryer disease. So what we see here is that there are uh, natural killer uh, uh, cells increase significantly in keratoconus, but not so, it doesn't happen so in Dryer disease. So what do we translate by this is that we have the ocular surface inflammation, no matter what kind of inflammation differ differing from Dryer disease to a different spectrum of dry Dryer disease has different signature. And this helps us understand Dryer disease slightly better. What essentially are we looking at here is if there are specific drug targets. Now, um, the, uh, the Dryer disease NEJM um, paper published uh, in 2018 says that um, uh, cyclosporin acts as a mainstay treatment for Dryer disease and it has been FDA approved as well. Why does this happen is uh, when we looked at this signature, Restasis and cyclosporin tend to block the pathway, which the intersignaling pathway, which essentially start the uh, inflammatory uh, milieu that gets collected. So the chemokines are blocked, which essentially stops the um, uh, the stromal changes that happen, the epitheliopathy that happen, um, also the inflammation and the nociceptive factors. So restasis uh, is justified or cyclosporin, this uh, specific experiment was done with restasis. So this is justified uh, when we are using these anti-inflammatory mediators. So going back to our case, now we know that the patient who has uh, uh, our um, ophthalmologist, she has pain without stain. She has been on treatment. She's a non-responder to the treatment. So what are we looking at? What is the missing link? Um, when we looked at the tear cytokine profile, of course, this uh, tear inflammatory uh, signaling was different in this patient. There was definitely an increased tear um, uh, uh, inflammatory profile, but none of these factors respond to our conventional treatment. They don't respond to restasis. They don't respond to um, the conventional treatment of uh, trehalose, which has been which has been used now, or tac tacrolimus. Um, so what we essentially did was we probed a little further and we found that autologous serum uh, also has got anti-inflammatory and um, uh, increased anti-nociceptive factors. Also, it is very, very effective um, for the conal neuropathic component. So essentially what we did in this case was we just deducted all her medication that she was on and put her on autologous serum. Surprisingly, this case has helped us understand Dryer disease a lot because uh, she got better only and only with autologous serum and none of the other factors were helping improve her symptomatology. Uh, just um, a word on what are the newer treatments that we are seeing. Uh, we are seeing the uh, light modulation therapy uh, treatment which again uh, theoretically is known to decrease the inflammation and decrease the nociceptive component. Um, Vitamin D will be spoken in detail by Dr. Rashmi. Um, uh, so what are we essentially looking at? Just to combine the whole uh, talk, we are trying to put all of this knowledge from the molecular aspect of it. Uh, we're trying to clinically translate it um, essentially by putting a point of care diagnostic kit. So some of us who have been attending a few of the dryer meets or the keratoconus talks um, by Nara Nitrale group, there is a small kit that everybody must be showing. It's a very small, handy kit. Essentially, what we this is based on Sandwich Eliza method. We are we can collect the tears. Just put on this. It's a very small, like a glucometer uh, sized um, diagnostic tool. We just need to put that uh, kit inside it, and we get readouts depending on what antigens we are specifically antibodies that we have incorporated on the kit. Um, our approach to this is that we need to integrate all this knowledge um, and we have to look as Dr. Rushad rightly covered from the uh, from the tear film, the composition of the tear film, look at the ocular surface and in, in entirety how is the ocular surface, what is it composed of and 
specific uh, drug treatments need to be discovered a little more in detail because we still are at a, um, at a horizon where we are not able to find the perfect treatment for dry eye disease. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Natasha. Any questions from the audience? Dr. Manchu, any comments? Okay, we'll, we'll take those a little later, but I think an important uh, thing to notice in dry eye, even the TFOS report says that treating dry eye is not a science, it's an art. So uh, basically, you have to keep your mind open and there are certain things that may work in certain patients which may not work in others. You have to be open to trying different things. Uh, so with that, I'll invite the next speaker, Dr. Rashmi Deshmukh from Center for Sight. She's a consultant working there. She's going to present on vitamin D and dry eye, science or science fiction. So vitamin D is a topic that has been causing a fair amount of controversy. Uh, everyone is vitamin D deficient according to uh, most of our lab parameters. So we're going to look whether it actually does play a role in dry eye and how much importance to actually give it. And that's what I think Dr. Rashmi is going to cover. Good morning, everybody. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Rishad for having me in this instruction course. Uh, my talk today is going to be on vitamin D and dry eye disease, whether it's a science or science fiction. So we all know that dry eye syndrome is a ocular surface disorder. The most uh, common problem with dry eye disorder is the discomfort and the visual disturbance that a patient has because of the tear film instability and uh, damage to the ocular surface. And it has been shown that it is accompanied by hyperosmolarity of the tear film and the uh, ocular surface is inflamed in this condition. So conventional management has included artificial tears, anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, punctal plugs and also autologous serum. But there are a lot of patients who fail to respond to any of these. And that's where people started thinking about vitamin D. So first of all, why we started thinking of vitamin D was that it has been shown by studies that vitamin D plays a very important role in uh, forming surfactants in the tear film to uh, reduce the evaporation of the aqueous layer. And secondly, it has also been shown that in the corneal epithelium and the conjunctival epithelium, there are a lot of vitamin D receptors. So it led people to think that vitamin D does have an important role to play in the maintenance of ocular surface. And also it has been shown that vitamin D has immunoregulatory effect on both adaptive and innate immunity by its action on CD cells and T helper cells as well. So we know that uh, uh, dry eye disease can be either evaporative dry eye disease or aqueous deficiency dry eye disease. So for evaporative dry eye disease, I would like to talk about the study which Dr. Natasha has already mentioned, which we published from Narayan Netrale. In this study, uh, ocular surface disease index score was used, which was divided into discomfort scale and vision subscale. So we were essentially looking at the discomfort subscale because that is what, uh, is more, that is what causes the more uh, symptoms of the patient. And confocal microscopy was done for all patients uh, in which we studied the number, um, basically the density and the morphology of immature and mature dendritic cells. So what are dendritic cells? They are mainly immunoregulatory cells or Langerhan cells which are at the limbus and they migrate towards the center of the cornea in any inflammatory condition. And we were essentially looking at the correlation between the density of the inflammatory cells with the ocular discomfort scoring. And we found that the density of mature dendritic cells uh, correlated with ocular discomfort and also that the OSDI score and dendritic cells were inversely correlating with the vitamin D levels. Then uh, these patients uh, were followed up with vitamin D supplementations and we saw that as the vitamin D levels improved, there was a decrease in their OSDI scoring and uh, the symptomatology improved in these patients. Now coming to aqueous deficiency dry eye disease. We all know that uh, TBUT is an indicator of tear film stability and lid margin hyperemia and fluorescein staining indicate inflammation and of course there's Schirmer's test to uh, see the aqueous production as well. So coming to tear film stability, it has been shown in aqueous deficiency dry eye disease that uh, vitamin D decreases the tear osmolarity and it increases tear st stability. It also stimulates the phospholipid synthesis and surfactant release thereby improving the stability of the aqueous layer and mucin layer. 
and it has also been suggested uh, in this particular study that it may act in synergy with hyaluronate and other artificial tears. So it, it might just improve the efficacy of the treatment the patient is already on. And of course it reduces inflammation like we've already seen that uh, it has action on helper T cells. Now it has also been shown to improve the tear secretion in aqueous deficiency and there are multiple pathways by which it does. First is its indirect action on parasympathetic innervation because vitamin D improves the dopamine secretion which is a neurotransmitter for parasympathetic system and we all know that lacrimal gland is innervated by the parasympathetic system which when stimulated improves the tear secretion. Secondly, vitamin D receptors are also seen on the epithelial cells in the lacrimal glands and they are believed to regulate the fluid and ion transport which is required for the formation of the tear film in the first place. And we also know, it has already been mentioned by Dr. Natasha, that vitamin D improves the uh, intestinal absorption of calcium. And it has been shown that calcium improves tear secretion. Some people are also suggesting use of calcium ointment for dry eye disease these days. Other than that, there are other possible mechanisms uh, like improvement in mucin density and goblet cell density and uh, maintenance of the corneal epithelial metabolism. And as she's already mentioned, Dr. Natasha, that it reduces uh, nociceptive factors as well. So once a patient has been diagnosed with vitamin D deficiency, what should we do? If the vitamin D level is less than 10 nanograms per ml, patient is put on injectable vitamin D, at least 3 lakh or 6 lakh international units monthly for 3 months, and then one should recheck the levels. If the vitamin D level is between 10 to 30, means it's mild to moderate deficiency, then patient can be put on oral supplementation of around 50,000 international units every week for 8 weeks and then recheck. Once the levels are brought to normal, then uh, attempt should be made to maintain it. So to conclude, recent studies have shown that vitamin D deficiency has a role in the etiopathogenesis of dry eye disease and it being a common problem, correction of the deficiency of vitamin D has a therapeutic importance in reducing dry eye. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Rashmi. Uh, as Dr. Himanshu sets up, I just had one question for Dr. Rashmi. Mm -hmm. So, when a patient comes to you with dry eye, when do you actually look for the vitamin D levels? Do you do them in every patient or... No, uh, if the patient uh, appears to be very symptomatic but it is not correlating with your clinical findings, that's when... I, and if, if he's just not responding to all your anti-inflammatory treatment and your artificial tears, if you feel you've done everything for the patient and still not responding, it's always a good idea to go in for a vitamin D test. Most of us are deficient in it anyway. Okay, thank you. So next, I'd like to invite Dr. Himanshu. He is the medical superintendent and head of cornea refractive in, uh, surfaces at Narayan Nitrale 2. Uh, Dr. Himanshu is our guru who we turn to for knowledge whenever we are in trouble. Uh, so he's going to be speaking on choosing the ideal lubricant for your patient. Thank you. Uh, so Rushad, uh, it's quite uh, nice of you to put up a course uh, like this thing and consider us for uh, uh, these things. Uh, whenever we have a dry course, I always wonder that uh, would there be any audience, would there be anybody who would be interested in such a dry topic? But mind you, um, though the topic is very dry, but this is something which is bread and butter of not only just ophthalmologists, but those company outside also. They survive on these lubricants, right? So remember, we are very important and very relevant when we talk about this thing. So my job today is to talk to you about selecting lubricant drop. And first question arises, why care about that? Why do we need to worry about it? I mean, just put lubricant drops and that's it. The problem is that whatever we do, Whenever we classify dry eye, whether it's aqueous deficient dry eye, evaporative dry eye, we are classifying dry eye based on the effect of the problem and not the root cause, right? Finally, what happens, you have abnormal tear film stability, but that's effect, that's not the root cause. Whether the tear film secretion is less, that's effect, that's not the root cause. Even the treatment. We give multiple lubricants, different, different lubricants, and every day person comes with, same company will come with three people who will talk about my lubricant, my lubricant. Uh, are we actually treating the root cause? We are not treating the root cause. We are treating the effect again. So how do we expect all these gamut, what we have for us, that it will take care of all our problem? Well, because we are not treating the root cause. We need to understand 
the pathogenesis of the problem and then only we can take care of that. So all the dry eye are not same, we know that. How can a dry eye with rheumatoid arthritis be same as dry eye with MGD and still will give same lubricant drop and expect everything to be fine? Well, that does not happen. So we must understand that we need to investigate for the root cause of the problem. Now before we go into those kind of uh, things, let's understand that when we talk about lubricants, my job today is just to talk about lubricant. When we talk about lubricants, we talk about ideal lubricant, but we know none exist because a lubricant is not an artificial tear. A lot of time we mispronounce this thing as artificial tear. There's no artificial tear. You cannot make a bloody tear. Forget about anything else because it's such a biologically active thing which cannot be replicated by us. So, well, there is no ideal lubricant exists. So whenever, whatever we have, let's dissect out in few components. So when we talk about lubricant, we have few components like preservative, electrolyte, viscose, elastic agent and the osmolarity part. Uh, remember one thing, irrespective of whatever it may be, not all the eyes are same. Whenever you give something to one patient, if he or she is happy, when you give it to another patient, he or she may not be happy. And you convey this thing to your patient also that, you know what, when you are not happy with the drop, rather than changing the doctor, we'll change the drop, right? If we understand this thing and if patients understand this thing, possibly that half of the problem will be solved. So let's start with the first and foremost preservative. We like to hate these guys, preservatives. And there are preservatives which are bad like benzalkonium chloride, which we just don't like. And there are some preservatives which are little gentle, which we still like, like those stabilized oxychloro compound or sodium perborate and those kind of thing. So let's talk about our main villain, which is benzalkonium chloride. And we love to hate this thing. And all the company will come and talk to you about that it's so bad. I agree, it's really bad. It's epithelial toxic and it's been studied uh, quite widely and I'm not debating here. But remember one thing, when we give drop four to six times in a day, the amount of this benzalkonium chloride which you're delivering to surface is not very huge. Also look at the dilution. When we put a drop after 30 seconds, the benzalkonium chloride gets diluted by eight folds and by three minutes, it's diluted by 36 folds. It's a very meager amount which is going to be on surface. So if ocular surface is healthy, you're putting drop four to six times. Uh, is it as bad? Well, I won't call it as bad. So we do, though we love to hate that, it's not as bad as we thought. But yes, certainly, I wouldn't like in my ideal lubricant anything which is toxic. So when we talk about little safer uh, preservatives like uh, stabilized oxychloro compound, they are preservatives still. Remember, they are themselves also surface toxic, but they convert into something which is relatively safer for the surface. This conversion happens because of a couple of things. So like some of them, they convert related to the ultraviolet exposure. So when person is exposed outside light or natural light, they get converted into safer compounds. But if person is inbound, they are not exposed to outside light, do you think all the entire molecule will get converted? Possibly not. So if you think that all these safer preservatives are preservative free, they are not. They themselves also can lead to some kind of epithelial toxicity. The only preservative free are unims, which we do not like and most of the company introduce and they disappear because Indian market somehow is not mature to use unims. Other preservative free are ointments. They can be preservative free. So we wish that in our ideal lubricants there should not be any preservatives uh, but if they are there and if you are using, if the surface is stable, don't worry about it too much. They, they're fine. They, they're going to be fine. Next thing is electrolytes. Well, there are multiple electrolytes which are there in natural tears and in artificial tears also we put multiple of them. One of them is sodium which is mainstay of osmolarity of the drop. So when you when you want to create a lubricant, you would like to keep it on little bit of alkaline side. And this is done by all these electrolytes. So sodium decides about uh, the osmolarity and which helps you to keep your lubricant iso-osmolar. Potassium helps in the maintenance of goblet cell. And bicarbonate is supposedly helping us in preserving the 
the TFL epithelium, uh, uh, the surface epithelium. However, whenever we are using devices which are reusable drops, when we open it and close it, like most of our drops, bicarbonate is unstable compound. It's going to get evaporated through carbon dioxide and it's not going to be there. So is it as effective as we say? Well, we don't know. Another thing about the sodium part. Now, sodium is important to maintain the osmolarity. But you know what? When you combine with our lubricants, when we talk about, say, carbomer, when we combine sodium with carbomer, actually the carbomer effectiveness comes down. So addition of isotonic saline with carbomer actually leads to significantly reduce viscosity of carbomer. Right? So again, when we want to make an ideal lubricant, we want everything together. But unfortunately, adding everything together is not going to reflect into better, better product. Next comes the viscosity agent. Now, these are the agents which we love. And this is just mere one part of the lubricant. But your entire industry thrives on this thing. They come, sir, we have CMC drop. Sir, we have HPMC drop. That's viscoelastic agent only. That's one part of the lubricant. And it's not the entire lubricant, right? So, but we still love them. Why? Well, it gives longevity to the, to the drop. It gives viscosity. It allows it to stay a little longer on the surface. But if you make the drop too much viscous, it will possibly stay on the surface and would lead to little blurring. It would also lead to crusting on your uh, lid margin and eyelashes and patient may not be happy. So every patient who walks in, if you say, I'll give you very viscous drop, they may not be happy because it's not required for uh, that person. Higher the molecular weight, more is the viscosity. Lower the uh, molecular weight, less is the viscosity. So there are multiple viscoelastic agent which we uh, deal with uh, and uh, from, uh, from our market point of view, when CMC has come under price control, suddenly we start seeing that all the companies are pushing for polyols, all these PVAs, uh, polyethylene glycols and suddenly every company has those things and they are priced much higher. But interestingly, polyols do not have viscosity themselves unless they are combined with an, another agent which is like HP Guar. Now, HP Guar is something which gives the viscosity to the polyols. So, if you do not have viscosity agent uh, combining with such kind of molecule, it's not going to be very viscous. So just because something has come under price control, the profit margin goes down, the company now wants to push something else, which is possibly not the best thing which you want. Also, remember one more concept of something called ocular surface resident time. So, that means when you put a drop on somebody's eye, how long it's going to stay on that person's eye. This holds true for everything, not just for lubricant, for antibiotics, for every eye drop which you put, you must know the ocular surface resident time of the drop. It depends on many things. It depends upon viscosity, blink rate, tear film turnover, temperature, pH of the surface, how the molecule absorbs or adsorbs uh, to the surface and the evaporation rate. So many properties which should decide how long the drop will stay on the surface. There are methods uh, which can allow us to check uh, the ocular surface resident time, direct, indirect method. But let's not worry about this thing. But I would uh, run you through a short, small little gist of a study which actually studied one of the most viscous molecule which we normally quote sodium hyaluronate, right? And all of us are told that sodium hyaluronate is most viscous. And they found in the study that the half-life, so we cannot talk about the entire molecule, how long it's going to last. So that's why we always, drug or anything, we always talk about half-life. The half-life of uh, this molecule, sodium hyaluronate, was as low as 5.5 minutes. Right. And if I give a little more advantage to it, say full life is 15 minutes, cannot be. Right. So even if I give that, you think about when you give a drop to patient and tell them to put four times in a day. That's homeopathic dose. It's not going to work. Right. And somehow as an ophthalmologist, we have habit of that four times a day. I don't know from where we learn, but lubricants we always give four times a day. It's just psychological. It's for you psychological as well as for patient psychological. You have to give them more frequently. It does not help. And look at the other agents like HPMC, PVA, 44 seconds. 
And if you give four times a day, patient sleeps for eight hours, I mean, really nice person, sleeps for eight hours and awake for 16 hours, in which 44 seconds, 44 seconds, 44 seconds, 44 seconds. And you expect every miracle that everything will be nice and it does not happen. That's because we are also at fault. We give them drop a little less. And interestingly, industry does not understand this thing. If they percolate this concept in our brain that doctor, four times is very less, you have to give longer. Instead of that, they come and tell, doctor, this is more viscous, now only two times. Come on. And crazy. That's, that's, that's something as crazy as they can get. So any lubricant four times a day, please remember, is not going to do anything. You have to give them more frequently. Again, talking about ocular surface, resident time and temperature. Temperature reduces viscosity. And with reduced uh, viscosity, ocular surface resident time reduces. So with the country like us, where the temperature can be quite high, again, the frequency has to be higher. And some of the medications like, say, hypermellose, carmelose, and all those things, at normal temperature also, they do not have enough uh, viscosity. At normal pH also, they do not have enough viscosity. So if you keep on using them, it's not going to help us because it's not going to stay longer on the surface. So you can certainly tell patient that, well, if you're using these drops, you can refrigerate it. There's no harm in that, right? But we tell them about fortified medication, uh, but we never tell about lubricants. So why lubricants? Lubricants you buy, one more. It's still not going to work. Role of pH. Now, pH changes also leads to change in the rheological property or viscosity of the drop. Most of the time, and one interesting molecule there again is HP Guar. Now, HP Guar, as I told you, with certain uh, drop, which is very important part of uh, their drop, and they said it lasts indefinitely. Our drop, uh, the HP Guar is viscous only at alkaline pH. It's actually liquid form when it's 7 pH, 7.5 it turns little gel form. But there are certain medication actually, so well I don't like to take names but uh, well for our common understanding I would say sustain ultra but there are many other drops which are similar. So when you combine medications like these kind of things, so many medications have acidic pH. So when you combine medications, you say cyclopentole, tropicamide, ofloxacin, lid patching, all these things lead to acidic pH. Your drop which you think is going to work as a lubricant is not going to work here. It's not meant to work at this pH, right? So remember that uh, combining multiple medication does not always help. There's some interesting fact about these lubricant. PVA is not very compatible with electrolytes like sodium borate, sodium sulfate and all those things. CMC gets crusted and it forms insoluble precipitates, especially higher molecular weight, one person in certain individual, depending upon the pH and electrolytes, and especially when it's uh, combined with uh, certain electrolytes. The next part uh, is the hyperosmolarity. Well, we know the hyperosmolarity. Uh, Rishad, you can stop me anytime if uh, I run out, run out of time. Then, okay, so the hyperosmolarity is something which is very important, and uh, there are plenty of studies about that. And they tell us then when the tear film becomes hyperosmolar, it drains out the water from inside, and it leads to epithelial dehydration. When epithelial dehydration occurs, as you can see here. The epithelium would like to rehydrate and it takes the water molecule inside and when that happens it's not controlled and cell will rupture and that's how cell will dry and it will die. So Rushar told us about osmometry that osmolarity checking you can do. Uh, there are now uh, uh, instruments which can help us to study the osmolarity. But interestingly, there is such a high test, retest variability in these uh, machines that uh, though they claim that 316, anything more than that is abnormal. But if you look at the entire data, abnormal cases like uh, dry eye cases have such a high variability that a lot of dry eye and normal, they have crossover. So normal patient also can have more than 316 uh, osmolarity and dry eye patient may have less osmolarity. In fact, there were studies which claim that normal, Sjogren syndrome dry eye, non Sjogren uh, dry eye, mild dry eye, moderate dry eye, all of them can have similar values. 
So does it help by sp spending so much money to buy an instrument which does not help you in either diagnosis, treatment, nowhere? Well, certainly not. So would, what would you do? Would you rehydrate it by possibly hypotonic solution? Unfortunately, that does not help because even if you put earlier our younger days, we used to have something called hypotears. These uh, medicines would reduce the osmolarity of surface and we wish that it would rehydrate the surface. Unfortunately, that does not happen. Osmolarity returns to its original level within a minute or so. So even if you keep hypotonic saline on the eye, it does not stay there. It's going to just uh, get countered by this thing. So what we can do is we can possibly have a way around this thing and we can use certain molecules which are osmoprotectants. So these molecules, there are various molecules like smaller molecules like glycerol, they go easily inside the cell, can be there, can come out also easily. So it can rapidly go inside but rapidly come out also. Erythritol goes in rapidly but comes out little slowly and L-carnitin goes with active transport it so little slowly comes out also little slowly. So when you combine all of them together, it can work for a little longer time. I do not have any financial disclosure here, but I would certainly wish that all my lubricants must have an osmoprotective agent, which certainly helps. And these are things which are already uh, published and studied in labs also, so it's not a big deal. Uh, inflammation, Richard told us about inflammation and we know that there are now... Um, uh, uh, kits or devices which help us to uh, so the lubricant part is over I'm, I'm just touching up that what else I can use along with the lubricant so if you see a, a test like this thing which tells you that you have a little higher MMP9 level does it mean that it's sacrocyant and it it gives uh, all the cases it must be done I won't say anything uh, like that but does it help well it can certainly help that when you do an MMP9 level and if you find that test is positive, that means significant inflammatory mediators are there on the surface. These kind of cases, you can certainly use anti-inflammatory molecules like topical steroid initially to start with, like cyclosporin and tacrolimus molecule. Where do they help? Well, mild to moderate cases and not burnt out cases. If you want to give any of these things, you must give in mild to moderate cases and do not wait for advanced diet. They do not uh, help. Tecrolimus clinically is thousand times more potent than cyclosporin. So if somebody can tolerate tecrolimus, I would certainly wish to give them tecrolimus. Tecrolimus is not a new molecule in veterinary science. It's been used uh, in animals for a pretty long time and dogs have very unique tendency. Uh, they have tendency of dry much worse than us. And it has been studied in that, uh, that it does help tecrolimus. There are clinical trials going on about tecrolimus and it mm, does show that tecrolimus has potential. Uh, cyclosporin tecrolimus, where do we use? Well, moderate to severe dry and especially when it's associated with any systemic disorders like rheumatoid arthritis, uh, graft versus host disease. Uh, any other uh, Sjogren syndrome and all these kind of things certainly would help and it's not a replacement uh, for lubricant. So to summarize, uh, we need to study the etiopathogenesis of dry eye. Hyperosmolarity is an important thing but we would love to have an osmoprotective agents in uh, our molecules. Inflammation in dry eye uh, needs attention and we can use cyclosporin and tecrolimus in selected cases. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. So uh, that really opened our eyes about lubricants, especially the frequency. I think that's something that we really need to take home. Uh, could you continue with the talk on plugs? If, sure, if I can yeah. do that. So Dr. Himanshu next is going to talk about punctal plugs uh, based on, I think he has a video to also show of how to do uh, punctal plugs. Yeah, one disclosure, uh, this is last minute edition. I had prepared this thing for SSTC course couple of years back. So it was with one of uh, the company Lensai and we had uh, jointly developed the video and all those things. So I, I must thank Devi Vyas uh, for that. So role of punctum plug. Now punctum plug is something which is uh, very uniquely underutilized in the Indian market. Again we have some very unique market in India where certain things just don't work. One is UNIMS 
We don't like unims, whatever form, whosoever comes, we don't like it. Second is punctum plug. Dry eye everywhere across the world, all the consultants, they would love to put punctum plug. But somehow, premier institutes in India also, they do not like to use punctum plug. We have some reservation against punctum plug, which is not just, I think we should be open for you know, everything. So, we know that lubricants or uh, palliative treatment is a first line of treatment and uh, that's where uh, the role of uh, uh, lubricants uh, come into picture. Mild to moderate cases are the cases where we use these uh, lubricant. The problem with the lubricant is uh, that as we discuss, it may not last long. In fact, you have to keep on pouring on the surface multiple times. Patient may not be very compliant to them and you, if you have a choice, to reduce the frequency, well, you should be happy. So what can you do? Well, you can at least reduce the egress of tear from the drainage channels and that's by occluding the punctum. It can be done by many ways, by cauterization, by punctum plugs, by doing small you know, patch uh, on the punctum of uh, a conjunctiva or of an amniotic membrane, many things. Many ways people have uh, tried uh, doing this thing, but basic idea is you reduce the drainage of the TFM and that's what uh, improves the, uh, the ocular surface resident time of your TFM. The procedure can be done uh, with a simple uh, temporary plug which can block uh, the punctum or the canaliculi there or it can be uh, done using an actual punctum plug which blocks the lacrimal punctum. So when you talk about punctum plug, not everything is punctum plug. In true sense, punctum plug has to block punctum but all these plugs are at different different level. There are some plugs which are at canalicular level, some plugs are at punctum level, so they are different. And the, the way they improve or the way they not improve or complicate the things also can be different. So punctum plug is very simple procedure and it, it's an office procedure, it's not a big procedure per se, I would say it's just a normal thing, it's a part of our treatment and uh, can certainly help us in selected cases. So we should be open to this thing. How does it help? Well, it improves TFM dynamics because it reduces the uh, egress of tear, lets the tear uh, be on the longer time on the ocular surface, so the tear volume increases, your te lower tear meniscus height increases, and it improves the total TFM stability. It reduces the frequency of the lubricant which you are putting on the surface, and it possibly can improve the compliance. It also improves if the surface is unstable, it may improve the vision of the patient also. So when do we uh, use, well most commonly we use an aqueous deficiency in, uh, dry eye where it's mild to moderate and uh, the, the TFM secretion is there. Remember one thing, if we want to use a punctum plug or any punctum blocking device, there has to be some tear or enough tear which is coming from the natural source and then only it's going to help. So if you do not have enough tears, even if you put punctum plug, it's not going to help. And typically we reserve punctum plugs for more advanced cases like rheumatoid arthritis and all and Sjogren's syndrome. Such cases sometimes can be quite disastrous where it's not going to be, uh, the TFM is not going to be there. So be aware that in all the cases it may not help. Well, the cases which are not good are cases where somebody has already blocked uh, nasolacrimal ducts, always do a syringing before putting any punctum plug. You must have patent nasolacrimal passage, otherwise do not put punctum plug, you will end up actually having further complication. Contraindication by somebody who is allergic to silicon, which is not common, but somebody is, you must not uh, use uh, these things. Somebody uh, has multiple medications which are in use like say glaucoma medication, multiple glaucoma medication. Remember all these medication can be significantly epitheliotoxic. If you put punctum plug, you're going to continue putting them on surface for much longer time. So just be aware of uh, uh, that. So how do we uh, go about for the, for the punctum plug? Well, first let's decide about punctum plug. What are the different types of punctum pluggable? So punctum plugging can be done temporarily or it can be done permanent, uh, permanently but 
remember permanent does not mean permanent uh, whatever method you use it still would be partly little extended period of time but not permanent and it may be reversible also according to lo location as i told you that it can be something like where is my okay yeah i got it yeah so according to location it can be a punctum plug or according to location it can be canalicular plug also right so let's go by the duration if it's a temporary plug or short term plug these are the plugs which are quite cheaply available they are put in the vertical part of the canaliculi and uh, these are made up of collagen a lot of people use uh, their own innovative method uh, by using catgut and those things you can do this they would mind you this is extremely cheap there is no need to do such kind of uh, circus and try to reduce that 100 rupees also from that or not even 100 rupees it's so it's certainly worth keeping some of them if you are planning to put other punctum plug keep this short term plug in your kitty uh, they, they usually work for 7 to 10, 10 days and then they usually uh, dissolve. The advantage there? Well, it will tell you how the patient is going to take up the permanent plugging. Typically, you put this plug in the low, inferior canaliculi and most of the time, superior canaliculi, you reserve and you do not uh, touch there. But if you want to put bicanaliculi, you can put. But normally, the standard of care is most of the plugs we put in lower canaliculi. So same with temporary plug also we put in lower canaliculus. See the response. If patient is happy, well, we'll be convinced for a little more costly device, which is permanent plug. There's also something which is uh, intermediate uh, duration or extended duration of these temporary plug, which are again similar, but the, uh, the chemical nature is a little different that it stays for almost 60 to you know, 90 days and dissolves slowly cost wise they may not be very high so wherever you want a punctum plugging to be done for temporary purpose maybe your post refractive cases your recurrent corneal erosions or your cases where uh, where you feel that there is persistent epithelial defect or something well you can certainly use that and not only that in your dry patient who is not able to afford those, those permanent plugs you can use uh, these guys also in the permanent plug, again, there are different different uh, variety of plugs available depending upon the material, whether it's uh, uh, acrylic uh, thermo, uh, thermodynamic material or hydrogel or silicon material. There are different different materials which are uh, available. So the smart plug, which is uh, thermodynamic hydrophobic acrylic material, is something which is quite unique and quite innovative uh, technology where you have a small rod. This rod, you insert partly almost three-fourth into the vertical canaliculi and with the warmth of uh, the canaliculi and uh, and the uh, the body this material will melt and get absorbed and will become smaller i'll show you one uh, video which is there on their website uh, so the plug which goes vertically and it gets absorbed and just stays in the canaliculi and that's how it works it's very simple the smart plug uh, which is available in uh, okay so you peel it off and once you open it you realize that there would be a small rod which is a uh, acrylic uh, rod which stays there there are forceps which are available which are grooved forceps our uh, most of the people they do manufacture this thing but uh, the company itself gives you forceps the trick here is to remember you have to refrigerate both forcep as well as the plug because with an ambient temperature otherwise in your no, no stock room only it will be totally melted so do not do that both plug as well as forcep needs to be refrigerated so once you put uh, the plug inside and uh, after a while you will see that it's just going to go inside it will just disappear you see it's going inside yeah that's as simple as this thing so I remember one mm, such case when I was uh, doing my fellowship in uh, Johns Hopkins Wilmer we put uh, this thing and uh, I put in fact I was the culprit and I didn't do syringing before and patient after a month came with acute decrocystitis so remember these things are not uh, 
are not an option if you want to do punctum plugging you must do syringing before so there are other plugs which are silicon plugs like herix plug now herix plug is something which is quite simple uh, where you can put in the lacrimal canaliculi pull the lid uh, on the temporal side and make uh, the canaliculi stretch and horizontal go ahead and put it in uh, almost uh, in, uh, the vertical portion or horizontal portion of the common uh, horizontal portion of the canalicula when you come out because of the nature of itself it's going to just stay inside similarly if you talk about the collar stud design of the punctum plug or rather true punctum plug these are the plugs which stay on the surface now remember herix plug goes inside so typically sizing is not very important thing there but you must still have idea about the sizing it comes in three size small medium large so depending upon the size of the canalicula which we'll discuss uh, you decide that but the sizing it becomes very important when you are putting collar stud plugs or the true punctum plugs if the punctum is very large your plug is small it's going to come off if punctum is very small and you try to put the plug you won't be able to put it and if you go ahead and dilate the punctum and which loses its tone your plug is going to come out so be very sure about the sizing of this thing so without uh, spending much time what i'm going to show i'm going to show you a video with canalicular and punctal plugs permanent punctal plugs vera plug is made of silicone and is designed to provide a simple and effective treatment for a chronic dry eye it conforms to the shape of the punctal opening to ensure long term occlusion until removed or extruded Vera plug is specially designed to provide excellent patient comfort and superior retention. Selecting the most appropriate size prevents migration or spontaneous extrusion. The Vera plug punctal sizer is a simple tool to identify the best fit. So, before I go ahead, I must tell you that if you want to do anything related to punctum plug, just get this instrument. This is a simple thing. It's nothing extraordinary. it's just punctum sizer right we we have been uh, talking about this thing on our why why was it table on uh, in our exams okay what size uh, um, uh, probe and all those thing but we do not use them but now commercially you have this kind of device which are available which are very simple on one side it has 0.6 diameter on other side it has 0.8 diameter it's as simple as that and it's not a big deal all you need to do is just take this probe and now the next part of the video which is very important uh, part you can go, oops oops sorry dry eye management with canalicular and punto plug silicone and is designed to provide it conforms to the shape of term occlusion vera plug is specially this retention or spontaneous extrusion the vera plug punctal sizer is a simple tool to identify the best fit plug size so on one side 0.6 another side 0.8 in the dilated punctal opening insert the 0.6 mm tip so when you go a with 0.6 inside insertion indicates a small opening and if 0.6 does not go inside it's very small it can be easily inserted take it out turn the size around and insert the 0.8 mm tip a loose fit or easy insertion indicates a large opening choose the right plug large a snug fit for both ends indicates a medium opening choose the right plug medium implanting and removing the vera plug so there are multiple such kind of devices which are available in the us market and other markets the pump will opening before implanting the plug however if dilation is required it is necessary to dilate it just enough to insert the vera plug into the opening excessive dilation may cause the punctal annulus to be overly stretched potentially increasing the risk of punctal migration or extrusion to implant the plug introduce the preloaded tip 
inside the pellicle opening, with the dome resting on the opening, and let it rest there for a few seconds. Wait till the shaft below, the dome gets surrounded by tissue, in a firm grip, and then, press the release button on the side, to retract the pin on which the plug was loaded, and remove the inserter. The plug has been successfully implanted. When removing Vera plug, it is absolutely essential, to avoid pulling the dome of the plug. It may break the dome, making removal difficult. Always introduce the forceps under the dome, and maintain a good grip of the shaft. Slowly pull the plug out. A little wiggling motion also helps. Canalicular Plugs Vera C7 is a short-term plug, made of absorbable collagen, and is typically used to determine the effect of treatment on dry eye symptoms as well as to evaluate EP4 tolerance. Vera 90 is an extended duration plug ideal for the treatment of dry eye following LASIK or other surgical procedures. Both Vera C7 and Vera 90 are at times also used for extending medication contact time or for treating the dry eye components of various ocular surface diseases in planning Vera C7 and Vera 90. Temporary canalicular plugs can be inserted using either a jeweler's forceps or a grouped forceps. Using the forceps, lift the insert out of the holder. And gently inserts it into the punctal opening. Gently push it deeper into the canaliculus. Should removal become necessary, it may be flushed out by an also lacrimal irrigation. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Himanshu. It's, it's almost like meditation listening to you. Um, so this is, has been the most informative talk, personally for me, that uh, throughout the session. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Um, uh, up next, I would like to invite uh, our Chief Instructor, Dr. Rashad. So, uh, Dr. Rashad will be speaking to us um, about looking beyond lubricants, the newer treatment modalities in dry eye disease. Do we have any questions in the meantime? Uh, Dr. Rashad sets up his laptop. Okay, so I think most of the treatment has been uh, kind of covered. I'm just going to go through a few things that haven't been mentioned so far. Uh, so again, the treatment report from the TFOS uh, uh, report for treat uh, for TFOS due to report includes tear insufficiency uh, treatments, treatments for lid abnormalities, anti-inflammatory therapy, surgical approaches, dietary modifications, etc. Most of this has been covered. I'm just going to mention a few things that. Uh, we haven't yet uh, read about. Natasha mentioned about autologous serum. One way it helps is uh, it, con it has the same pH, nutrient contents, it has vitamins, fibronectin, epidermal, and nervous, uh, nervous growth factor, which helps to uh, promote healing, and it inhibits the inflammatory response. The disadvantage is you require serological testing and the problem of contamination. Uh, you also have allogenic serum, umbilical cord serum, and platelet-derived plasma. However, these are not really gone into vogue. Uh, mucolytics like N-acetylcysteine have been used in filamentary keratitis. The brand which comes is Mucomix, which you reconstitute with 5 ml in 5 ml of artificial tears, and you can use this for filamentary keratitis. Uh, now, secretagogues, you have uh, dicofasol, uh, the mucin secretagogue repubind, and oral, which is pilocarpine and sevamelanine. Now, uh, I do not have any uh, personal experience with dicosol uh, as such, 
but pilocarpine we are using in uh, Sjogren's uh, syndrome. Basically, these are muscarinic acetylcholine receptor agonists, and it improves parameters uh, except for the Schirmers as such. Uh, however, you have to be careful of the side effects, which include nausea, sweating, excess salivation from the mouth, excessive urination. So you have to tell the patient. Can you please? Okay, okay there it is. So, yeah. So uh, basically, these side effects you have to be a little careful of when you are prescribing it to your patients. Uh, now, in blepharitis, uh, I'm just going to talk about Demodex, uh, not very commonly seen. Uh, however, the uh, treatment is with tea tree oil, with the, which is steamed Malilica alternifolia leaves. Uh, basically, uh, now you're getting scrubs and a shampoo of tea tree oil, which you use uh, once a week for the scrubbing, uh, scrubbing and daily shampoo. The side effect is a little stinging and burning. Oral ivermectin also has a role in Demodex uh, colonization. Uh, so mebumin gland dysfunction is something I'm just going to focus on a little bit more. The MGD workshop rep recommends a staged approach depending on severity. And there's additive t uh, therapy. That means stage 3 requires treatment of stage 1 and 2 along with what is recommended for stage 3. So how do you stage? Uh, based on what I was talking about earlier, the expressibility. So minimally altered expressibility and secretion quality is stage 1 with no corneal staining. Mildly altered expressibility and secretion quality with limited staining is great, uh, stage 2. Uh, moderate, mainly peripheral staining along with moderately altered expressibility and secretion quality is stage 3. And stage 4 has marked uh, central corneal staining and severely altered expressibility. There's something called plus disease. Now what is this? Uh, uh, specific conditions which kind of uh, go along with it. So flictinular keratitis, mucosal keratinization, brachiasis, etc., all come under plus disease. So in stage one, consider warm compressors that help liquefy the mebum, lid hygiene with eyelid scrubs, and digital expression is a must. But what I mentioned is the problem with this is not all our patients tolerate that kind of pressure. So the MG evaluator and certain therapies that give a, a, a constant amount of pressure which can be tolerated are helpful. Stage 2 includes stage 1 along with that eye masks uh, which are now uh, available with the Evolve and Bruder groups uh, providing eye masks, Lippy Flow, IPL, humidifiers which change the environment, omega-3 fatty acids which is a bit of a controversial topic and lubricant, uh, you obviously have to do your lubricants, topical azithromycin and oral tetracyclines. Stage 3, you go on with oral tetracyclines along with the earlier mentioned treatments. Oral azithromycin has also been shown to have a similar effect to doxycycline. Paraffin-based lubricants can be used at this stage. And you can consider anti-inflammatory therapy, again, like Dr. Himanshu showed, based on the MMP9, and if you're suspecting an inflammatory pathology. Uh, stage 4 includes stage 3 therapy along with steroids. Now, other strategies include the maskin probe, which can be seen over here, which is a 60, uh, 76 micrometer diameter probe uh, for probing the uh, mebumian gland openings. It's designed to disrupt any fibrovascular membranes that may accelerate gland dysfunction, truncation, and possible dropout. Debridement has also got a mention in this to get rid of the hyperkeratinized material. Blepharsteam is a device which resembles a swimming goggle and is plugged into an electrical outlet to provide latent heat without pressure on the eyelids. Uh, a moistened insert is placed into each sealed watertight chamber to provide a warm, high humidity environment over each eye. Uh, so what study showed was it reduced the tear film ev evaporation and the lower eyelid was warm for longer than with traditional warm compressors. Uh, so the eye masks that I mentioned from Bruder and Evolve, uh, these are microwavable for about 20 to 30 seconds and followed by application over the eyes for about 10 minutes. IPL therapy uses a broad spectrum light which is emitted between 515 and 1200 nanometers. The light is converted to heat energy and decreases the microvasculature and telangiectasias along the epidermis and liquefies solid, uh, solidified mebum. Uh, the drawback is that uh, studies say it's not, not very useful in pigmented individuals. It requires multiple sitting and, it, and it's cumbersome. Uh, so I have personal experience with the lippy flow. Uh, this is the, <coughs> sorry, the lippy flow screen and the activator with a vaulted design with a shell which protects the cornea from the heating event. Uh, good candidates for Lipifro are uh, patients with MGD with one-third to two-third loss of glands, tortuosity and dilation of the glands, low, uh, low lipid layer thickness, and poor TBUT. This is just a video showing how the vectored thermal pulsation works. Uh, 
So the, the conformer goes inside the eye. Uh, this is the device actually giving the massage. It heats up to 42 degrees uh, Celsius. And uh, the external portion of the cell, uh, shell containing heating elements, which warms to about 108 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so what this does is it massages the lid, expresses out the mebum at the same si uh, time as giving about 42 degrees Celsius of heat. So these are just some studies showing the, the usefulness of lippy flow. Uh, it can be used across stages also if excess dropout is, uh, is absent. Uh, the drawback of it is the cost, which I, I think the company is working on. Uh, so to conclude for MGD, diagnosis and all careful study at the slit lamp, use of questionnaires, uh, the, the modalities that I mentioned earlier, and treatment should be done in a staged manner. Inflammation, I think, has already been covered by Dr. Himanshu in detail, as is vitamin D therapy. Just a mention of surgeries which have been used in dry eye. Tasurefi for your lid abnormalities uh, can be used. For conjunctival calases, electrocoagulation, fixing to the sclera or an argon laser have been suggested. Uh, Prokera is a device with human amniotic membrane which can be used in severe dry eye, and this helps to keep the membrane on the surface for a little longer. And the last thing that is mentioned is salivary gland transplantation. Uh, parotid duct uh, transplantation is one thing that has been mentioned. Uh, along with that, the minor salivary gland transplantation, uh, which uh, increases the amount of mucin and tear film production as such. It's useful in severe dry eyes, although the, the consistency of the tear film is kind of different. Thank you. So, I think we just have time for one or two questions, if there are anything or any closing comments. Yeah, I just wanted okay. to ask, anybody can ask, um, answer. Between, uh, are there any particular instances where you select, have a uh, choice between cyclosporine and um, what do you call, tractrolimus? Because um, <coughs> tractrolimus will be on a, uh, what do you call, paraffin base, right? And it will tend to distort the aqueous layer more, right? and cyclosporine will be an aqueous base, so it will be having more spreading effect, it will not get sort of uh, uh, broken up, br uh, breaking effect of the tear film. So, uh, when you talk about paraffin base, it does not break tear film. In fact, somebody who has significant lipid layer <coughs> deficiency, the the best treatment to be, let me just finish, let me just finish. No, just wonder, the aqueous component is always already is, uh, sort of compromised, right? The, the thickness of the aqueous component is alway, already compromised. On that perspective, I just wonder. No, it doesn't matter. What I want to convey is when you have somebody who has uh, significant uh, lipid layer deficiency or uh, mucin deficiency, the, the best treatment if you want to give them would be uh, an ointment which is paraffin based ointment. If you have to give a person who is Steven Johnson syndrome one treatment that would be a paraffin based lubricant. Does it alter the aqueous component uh, part or uh, any treatment modality? It certainly can because it's hydrophobic in nature. Unfortunately, we do not have tecrolimus eye drop commercially available as of now. Com Tecrolimus eye drop have been published and has been used and it's under FDA trial. So in a short while we might have FDA approved tecrolimus eye drop also. But as of now when you do not have availability of tecrolimus in eye drop form, you have a choice between tecrolimus ointment which is tecrolimus as a molecule thousand times more potent than cyclosporine versus a cyclosporine uh, drop which is in a drop form, it's possibly a little more comfortable for patient to put and a little more uh, uh, poss possibly receptive uh, to the uh, patient. But if patient can actually put the tecrolimus ointment without any irritation, I seriously don't mind because we have been using tecrolimus ointment for allergic eye disease for really, really long time with very decent outcomes there. No, sir. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. I think we, we, we closed. Just once. We already Before eaten up their time, so uh, it would be very unfair. Why can't we discuss their uh, in person? I think we, we have to give it to them. Thank you, Dr. Himanshu.